We're in Wales on one of the UK's greatest driving roads. Behind the wheel of the car that literally everyone is talking about, it's the new Lotus Amira. It's also chucking it down with rain, but frankly, I couldn't care less because I haven't been this excited about testing a new car for a long, long time. Just look at it. This is what matters, isn't it? Job number one, done. First, a bit of housekeeping. The car we're driving is a validation prototype, hence the rather fetching VP stickers, making this sort of a final sign-off drive. We'll drive the final production car next month, which is why Lotus has given us a list of stuff that's not quite finished yet. Stuff like this is the best available chassis tune, but brake feel, ride comfort and steering feel will all improve. Road and wind noise will improve too. There's a load of 3D printed and prototype parts in the interior and tour and sport driving modes are working, but track mode and turning the traction control off entirely is not. Trust me, we tried. But look, that's just the engineers covering their back. Personally, I couldn't really care if the infotainment needs its final flash or some of these interior components aren't quite the final production grade because we're here to drive this car. We're here to get under its skin, to get a feel for it on the road and to find out is the Lotus Amira as special as we all suspect? A word then on why we're so excited about this car. Firstly, the Elise and Zizian Evora are all dead, RIP, making this the last ever petrol powered Lotus and it has all the Lotus-y bits we love, like a bonded aluminium chassis and hydraulic steering, although at 1.4 tonnes, it's not exactly a flyweight. But this is the car designed to bring Lotus kicking and screaming into the 21st century with proper comfort, usability and technology. It doesn't look bad either. More on that in a bit. More than anything though, the Amira feels like a moment to pause and reflect on cars like this. Analog combustion engine sports cars because I'm telling you, they're not going to be around for very long. Certainly not with a Lotus badge on the bonnet because this is, as I said, the last ever petrol powered Lotus. The company is going all in on electric. Over the next three or four years, they're gonna give us two electric SUVs, a four door electric saloon. They're even making an electric sports car co-developed with Alpine. So stuff like this needs to be savored. All right, so what do we have here? We have the slightly softer touring suspension setup. You can get a sport setup, which is a bit firmer and more aggressive, but whichever one you go for, you've got passive dampers. You can't select the damper firmness on the move. You basically tick the box when you order the car, you make your bed, and then you have to sleep in it. And I like that. We've also got the less aggressively bolstered comfort seats, but we do have the driver's pack, which means we have a limited slip differential and the larger of the two engines. It's the familiar, supercharged Toyota sourced 3.5 litre V6 here with 400 horsepower and we've also got the six speed manual gearbox. Now you can get an automatic option in this car for about 1800 quid and there is going to be a whole second engine. Yes, AMG has donated its turbo two litre four cylinder nut job of an engine and that will be the entry level car but and I'm going to say this with some confidence. I'm pretty sure this is the combo you want to go for. Firstly, it's a Lotus, so you want a manual. And the gear shift quality here is really lovely. It feels nice and precise. It's nice and crisp as it moves around the gate. And it's only going to get crisper in the production car. And this engine, well, it's lovely. It's perhaps not as flamboyant as it has been in other Lotuses, but you've got that excellent throttle response and when you dial on a few revs it really starts to howl listen to that behind you and on liftoff you get lots of lovely little burps and hiccups on the overrun it's a powertrain with soul it's a powertrain with potency too lotus claims 0 to 60 miles an hour in 4.3 seconds and a top speed of 180 miles an hour 
Not so long ago, that was proper supercar performance. These days, it's merely mildly spicy. Prices for the V6 first edition start at around 76 grand, by the way, with a 60 grand entry level model, that's the four cylinder, coming in 2023. But since when was a Lotus all about numbers and quantifiable data? Hethel's best have always been measured by the sensations you get through your feet and your bum and your fingertips on the steering wheel. And it's good news here. I'll start with the steering, well, the steering wheel specifically, because it's a bit of an odd shape. The centre of the wheel, where you got your airbag, isn't actually in the centre, it's down here at the bottom. A bit disconcerting when you first see it, but actually the reason they've done that is to create this nice big void at the top so you get an excellent view of the digital instrument cluster behind it, so I'm going to let it pass. The steering itself, it's hydraulic. Lotus say there's still a few iterations to go and they're going to improve it further before the production car but honestly it feels fantastic. It's got that lovely natural organic feel and that's precisely what you want. In terms of the brakes, well I'm not going to harp on about the stopping power. They're more than capable of stopping this car but it's more about the feel. I drove the MC20 a few weeks ago and they had this really weird spongy feel so you never really knew where you were. With this whether you're brushing the pedal, the first two inches of the travel, or really stepping on them, you get that lovely modulation, you get feedback through the brake pedal telling you how close you are to locking up, and that's a very lotusy thing. And then we come to the chassis. Now, this is the touring suspension, but honestly, I implore you to go for it because the way this car moves down the road, it's just so supple. It moves about a little bit in the corners, but that's all just more communication coming back to you as a driver. And really the biggest thing with this car, the biggest take home message is just how refined and usable it is. Because I could happily turn this car around and drive the four and a half hours back to London, absolutely no trouble. Kick back, in comfort, listening to my podcasts. And you haven't been able to say that about too many Lotuses in the past. So it might not be finished this car, but it's tickling me in all the right places. So, it delivers on the road, but does it have proper supercar curb appeal for that 76 grand price? Let's find out. That's a bright green Lamborghini Huracan, the quintessential supercar for the Minecraft generation. The ten of penny here in Northern Wales, which is handy, because it shows us how supercar-y the design of the Lotus Mirror is. See. Where the Amira's rivals, the BMW M2, Porsche Cayman, Alpine A110 and Toyota Supra all very much look like sports cars, Lotus designers have given their sports car a bit of supercar makeup. Just look at it! Lots of clean surfaces but strong but powerful lines and sculpture. Check out this intake and another hidden one down here. It's all got an air of exotic about it and plenty of cues from its big older brother, the Avaya but more from the Huracan too. It's low and wide with broad shoulders and no active aero, so it gives it that really athletic look. But there's plenty of supercar styling cues too, like these exhausts with perforations, just like the Lamborghini. A fighter jet ignition, just like the Lamborghini. Plus a porthole, so you can look at the engine, just like the Lamborghini. Where a Toyota Supra looks a bit blobby and fussy with all its slashes and faux vents, the Amira has functional porosity, that's holes to you and I, to help ingest cold and extract hot air. That's very supercar, very Avaya. Overall, the Amira is just so wonderfully proportioned. It's just so dinky and nice with plenty of tricks to make you think it's smaller than it is. Are these big wheels? And those haunches, so when you get out of it, you look back at it, like you do in a Lamborghini. But this is 125,000 pounds more than that Amira. So it kind of passes the supercar test, but what's it like on track? I know the man for the job. Yeehaw! A mirror on track! This is where it counts, isn't it? Super excited about this, obviously, but it's a prototype, and a prototype no less, that's been testing all the driver assistance systems, the stuff that we don't normally like very much, the lane keep and radar crews which means obviously that the traction control is very much on, which is a little bit of a shame because it means no skids. And you get the feeling that with a little bit of a bung, 
and a bit of power, this would actually quite like to do a little slide. But a Lotus has never been about sliding, has it? It's been about playing at the margins of grip. It's been about all that beautiful balance, the steering feel. And that's what this still seems to be doing very nicely indeed. So two questions this car needs to answer really is how does it compare to the old Evora and Exige? And how does it compare to a Porsche Cayman? And the biggest difference for me, this is where it really stands apart from the older Lotuses, has nothing really to do with its track manners. It's how composed it feels, how refined and how good the NVH is. That's what's so impressive. The, there's no suspension noise. There's very little tire noise that comes back through. And the chassis feels so rigid. And that's such an advance for Lotus. Right, I tell you what, let's back it off and just talk you through the car a little bit. So this one has a touring chassis. And the touring chassis is important because it's the one that matters most, if you like, is for Lotus. They do a sport chassis, and of course it's got different springs and dampers, it's got tougher anti-roll bars and different bushing in the suspension, different tunes, and you get a Michelin Pilot Sport Cup tyre with it. But it's really quite track focused. And the Touring Pack is the one that's designed to do all the road stuff and a little bit of track use. So it's the one that's designed for everything really. This is the one, the Amira, that has to do it all and I'm really impressed with it. Look how well it manages its roll. Look, you just tuck it into a corner and it takes up a little bit of lean angle, but it just feels so deft. It doesn't feel heavy. And I think what they've done is quite clever, but they've made it wider and the width enables them to contain all that roll more progressively. Because that engine looks high in the back of the car. I think that's probably deceptive because the supercharger is obviously sitting on top of the V6 because it doesn't feel like the centre of gravity is high at all. It feels like it's really tucked down low and it doesn't feel like a heavy car. It doesn't feel like Exige light though. You are aware of that. And at the moment you can tell you haven't got quite got the real steering finesse. It will probably get in time, but it does feel good though. This uses a Goodyear Eagle F1 tyre and that feels very together actually. It's got a little bit of understeer. It runs softer tyre pressures at the front and it's a bit narrower just to keep that lovely steering feel right hard on the brakes down into the chicane and the brakes in this one and in fact all in all launch editions I have a two-piece system so they're a lighter weight they've got an aluminium hub and then an iron disc and the entry-level versions to get that cost down a little bit to under 60 grand will have a full iron one-piece system these are the standard seats and I'd quite like, I think I'd be looking at a sports seat actually, they're not quite firm enough, they're not quite not holding at the sides quite well enough for me. It's not super fast, but it's more than quick enough. I think it's because the supercharger obviously is so progressive all the way across the range that it's probably quite deceptive how fast you're accelerating. For a car that Lotus say is, well, depending on the part, which parts they're talking about, between 80 and 95% finished, this feels really, really ready and really, really good. So this or a Cayman GTS 4 litre? I mean, that's a really tough one because that Cayman is so, so good and probably more easily recommendable than this. But just in terms of all this quality and how easy it is to drive, that's a game changer for Lotus, and it makes this the most significant car Lotus has built since the Elise. Which means the only thing left to find out is how practical it is. You see, I expect a Lotus to have wonderful fearsome steering and handling from the gods, but what I don't expect of a Lotus is it to be very usable or particularly easy to get out of. And I speak from experience because I actually used to own an Elise. I loved it. The only reason I sold it in the end was 
because I got bored of it breaking down. So what I'm more interested to see is not to go for a play on the track, but to see if Lotus has started to sweat the small stuff. For example, in the new Lotus, do you have to choose between taking a passenger or your luggage? Right, open the boot and in it goes with just enough space left over for a rucksack. Right, job number one done. Let's get inside. Well, test number two is off to a flyer as well because how easy was getting in? Very different from the old Lotus. Now, I'm exactly six feet tall and I fit very comfortably. Adjusting the driving position can be easier because electric seats in a Lotus and plenty of room still behind me. So if you're a bit taller, you'll probably still fit. Also behind me, there's a big old luggage shelf. There's 200 liters back there. Now you don't get that in a Porsche Cayman, but of course Porsche Cayman has a boot in the nose and this doesn't. So swings and roundabouts. Okay, let's play a game. Spot the Volvo switch gear because of course Lotus is now bankrolled by the Chinese company Geely who also owns Volvo, so they've used some parts bin stuff. I can spot Volvo indicator stalks and mirror and window buttons here and maybe that volume knob, but Volvo switches are very nice, so I don't find that a problem. It's quite cohesive. It doesn't feel like a mishmash of different parts bin stuff from whoever was cheapest. And these screens, now they're not Volvo. They seem to be bespoke. 10 and a quarter inches for the touchscreen here, 12 inches for the display back there. I've just connected my phone and Apple CarPlay is working. That all bodes very well. It's a lot easier than connecting your phone in a Golf these days. So are you paying attention, Volkswagen? Learn something from Lotus. Okay, what about practicality? Let's get back to it. Down here, big glove box. In the doors, door bins. They've been carpeted so things don't rattle. I've got illuminated cup holders and there's a rubberized mat here and charging down there. I also like that we've got physical climate controls. Yes, there's a big touchscreen, but Lotus still has the common sense to give you knobs and switches for making it hotter and colder. Now, I'm not going to get stuck into the actual trim quality because, as you know, this Emira is a prototype. So a lot of these bits have actually been 3D printed. That's quite innovative, isn't it? But it's not finalised. What I can tell you is that it passes the smelly test. An old Lotus smell of glue and of plastic and of regret and whatever flavour links the guy who built it was wearing. But this, well, it just smells a bit more expensive and professional and finished. Altogether, the impression is of a cabin that's been designed not only to feel like the whole fighter pilot cliche, but to be cohesive and quality and, well, not embarrassed next to a Porsche. Oh, that is a graceful exit. You know, I really do hope that Jack, Rowan and Ollie want to split one of these with me because I haven't been a Lotus owner for a while, but I do now want to be one again.